Our scripture reading is found from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, and I invite you to read along with me and to even read it out loud. So let's stand together and recite together these words from Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Thank you. You may be seated and may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. I love that phrase, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, because with that admonition, the Apostle Paul is telling us, look, here are the things the Spirit of God is trying to cultivate in your life. Here are the personal characteristics, the virtues, the Christ-likeness, that transformation by the Spirit happens with you. So cooperate. Go along with the Spirit. We all know that the Spirit can be resisted. There are phrases in the Bible such as, grieve not the Spirit of God, or quench not the Spirit of God. In the days of Noah, the Lord said, my Spirit will not always strive with man. And so the Holy Spirit is at work in you, but you do not want to resist him. You want to cooperate and allow these things to be developed. You need to be aware of what these characteristics are, these virtues that the Holy Spirit is developing in you. Go along with it. Last week, we looked at the virtue of goodness. We are only going to look at two of these virtues. There's reason. We looked at the virtue of goodness, looking benevolently upon men and compassionately upon others, And seeing their needs as God would see them, it's closely related to agape, love, right? Sure it is. Goodness. And only God can give us goodness. Because as Romans 3 reminds us, in our natural condition, there is none who seeketh after God. There is none who does good. And so we want to look for the welfare of others and for the good of others. Goodness is a God-given character trait. Developed by the Holy Spirit. I'll come back to that in a moment, but let's again get the drift of Galatians so we know what's going on. The first three chapters tell us and reinforce the idea that we are justified by faith. God declares us to be righteous with the righteousness of Christ by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and our sins are forgiven. This as an adjudication, as it's called. It's a judicial proclamation. It takes place in the mind and in the counsel of God. It's a result of what Jesus did on the cross for us. Our sins are placed there upon him. His righteousness is placed upon us so that in our standing before God, we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. While it is a flawed statement, and I agree it's flawed and it's somewhat weak, yet if you can remember that little phrase, just as if I had never sinned, it, it's adequate, weak but adequate to express the great doctrine of justification. But in its fullness, it means that Christ's righteousness is upon me. I stand before God with the righteousness of Jesus. When he looks at my account and the books are open and we are assured in the book of Revelation that someday the books will be open. When the book is open on my life, he does not see my sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ, the perfect, holy righteousness of Christ. My sins were placed upon Jesus at the cross. It is judicial. It is a declaration that God makes, but it doesn't do a whole lot for my soul or my personal growth. And so the Holy Spirit, we learn now, comes into my life, comes into my soul, 
And as chapter 4 says, verse 19, he begins forming Christ in us. There is a formation that takes place, a transformation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. I am crucified with Christ, yet I live, but not I. It's Christ who lives in me. And so he is forming Christ in us. And how do we know that Christ is being formed in us because we see ourselves drawn to these virtues called the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I'm dwelling upon two. Last week, we looked at goodness. Today, we want to look at faithfulness. And there is a reason for that. Matthew chapter 25, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the parable of the talents, talks about the master who is going to go away, and he leaves talents with his servants. By the way, I'm coming back to that story, that parable, later this morning. But he gives talents to his servants. And when he gives his servants those talents, some use them for good. One does not. He wastes his, what we are to learn are his spiritual gifts and his opportunities that God gives. But to those who use them well, The Lord, the master upon his return says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So we'll look at goodness. We'll look at faithfulness. And servant, of course, is doulos, the bond servant, one who gives himself to do the master's bidding, the master's will. Faithfulness. The most popular national park in the United States of America is Yellowstone National Park. They tell me that if you plan to go to Yellowstone National Park and want to stay at a motel or a lodge or even camp there, you must make your reservations at least one year in advance because of its enormous popularity. It is popular because of its beauty. It's wildlife, and it's geysers. And there is one geyser in particular that is the most famous of all, called Old Faithful. The other geysers are perhaps named, but they're unknown. But everybody's heard of Old Faithful. Old Faithful is popular because like a clock. Every 65 minutes, over 700 feet of boiling hot water comes gushing out of Old Faithful, shooting up into the air. Every 65 minutes. Park rangers will tell you at Yellowstone that you can set your clock by Old Faithful. It has never failed yet. 700 feet of boiling water going up into the air every 65 minutes. People appreciate this geyser. The others erupt, but not on a regular basis. It is the faithfulness of old faithful that endears this geyser to the tourists. And I wonder, as God in heaven above looks down upon our lives, if perhaps it is not our faithfulness that endears us to him. Some of us have great abilities. And again, this is part of the parable of Matthew 25, where one servant is given five talents, one is given two, and a third one is given one. Some have greater abilities and greater opportunities than others. But God rewards faithfulness and expects faithfulness from us. And that is why Jesus, using this parable, phrases the the reward time as good and faithful. You were good and you were faithful. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Faithfulness is an attribute of God. And maybe that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in our minds and in our lives as he cultivates faithfulness in us, reminding us that Christ is being formed in us. 
Christ who was faithful. God who was faithful. We are becoming godly as we develop faithfulness. In the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, and what may be a very familiar verse to you, the scriptures say, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Of course, one of the great songs of our faith has that title. Great is your faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord unto me. Lamentations 3. God is a faithful God. We see it all the time. When we are tempted, or I should say, well, tempted by sin, God is faithful to make a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above you or able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Ann Landers used to write in her advice column, I can resist anything except temptation. Some of us are that way, aren't we? Todd Hosteller, our youth and sports pastor, sent me a note yesterday and said, I'm not feeling well at all. Please don't expect me at church tomorrow. It was a text. So I texted him back and I said, who's covering the high school class? And he said, Brian Walton will be there. Thank you, Brian, for stepping in. I'm pinch hitting for Todd this morning. So I stepped in to make sure everything was okay and Brian was there and lo and behold, he'd brought some donuts. So I had to peek and see what time he brought, of course. I can resist anything except a glazed donut. So I helped myself, which I didn't need, but I did anyway. When you are tempted, remember that God is faithful to make a way of escape. Look for the way of escape. Because it's there. A revivalist, I remember hearing when I was a child, and churches used to have revivalists come in quite often, and usually twice a year anyway. But a revivalist, I remember hearing as a child, used to tell the story about a man who had been converted at the church, and he had been a hopeless alcoholic, and he was on the wagon for several weeks, and one night rang the doorbell of the pastor's home, and the pastor opened it up, and there he was, inebriated. Pastor invited him in, gave him some black coffee, and after he'd sobered up, he said, what happened to you? And he said, well, every night when I walk home from work, I pass the tavern, and it got to where I couldn't resist anymore. And the pastor said, you need to find a new way home from work. Find a different route. Go a different way. Find the way of escape, because it's there. God is faithful to give us a way of escape during time of temptation. God is also faithful when we have been touched by sin. 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9 says, God will confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. He's faithful to keep us to the end. He is faithful. We may not be faithful. We may at times fail God, disappoint God, but God is faithful. He'll keep us to the end. And then God is faithful when we have sinned and confess it to forgive us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. Did you notice as I recited those four verses of Scripture? Lamentations 3, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 
1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, 1 John 1, 9, that that phrase, that refrain is repeated over and over. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Now, if we are to become godly people, he would expect faithfulness to be developed in our lives. Faithfulness can be a matter of discipline, but it is also a matter of desire. Do we really desire God? Well, do we? Do we? In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, in a picture of our Lord returning to this earth as judge, John sees in the Revelation our Lord Jesus Christ coming back, and he says, chapter 19, verse 11, I saw heaven opened, and there before me was a white horse, and the rider bore the inscription, Faithful and true. Our Lord Jesus Christ has been faithful to everything God the Father has told him to do, has sent him to accomplish. And all that he speaks is true. And in this particular specific reference, Revelation 19.11, what John is saying is all the promises of injustices being righted and of sin being judged and of wrong being done away with are now about to happen because the Lord of the universe, who is faithful and true, will come back and make things right. Well, we are called to be faithful, aren't we? I think that we need to remember the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. To me, that virtue jumps out from amongst the others. Faithfulness. We cannot all sing in the choir, we cannot all usher, we cannot all teach Sunday school or preach, but we can all be faithful. First of all, faithfulness is how God views responsibility. We have been given responsibility as believers, as his child, as Christians. Matthew 25, Jesus gives the parable of the servant, uh, the servants who are remaining and the master who is going away. The master goes away and gives to his servants talents. One is given five talents. One is given two talents. One is given one talent. These speak of our spiritual gifts as well as our opportunities. And as I said earlier, not all of us have the same degree or amount or kind of spiritual gift. It's a good thing. If we all had the same spiritual gift, we'd be known as people who were, say, encouragers. But we wouldn't get anything done from the organizational end because you've got these 12 spiritual gifts. Administration is one. Teaching is one. Exhortation, which includes music and preaching, moving people to action. Exhortation, that's a third one. So we don't all have the same spiritual gifts. There are nine others. We don't all have those. Some have the spiritual gift of helps. They love to work in the background and just help others. If others get the credit, that's okay. But God knows who they are, and they help out. I think of our Sunday school teachers in that respect, and our jam workers and teachers. But different talents, different spiritual gifts, different opportunities are given to, other, uh, to all of us. And we are to use them. God has given us these spiritual gifts and these opportunities for his glory. 
in this parable, Jesus reminds us that we are owners of nothing but stewards of everything. Everything we have comes from God. Every good and spiritual gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights, who does not vary. He's very faithful, in other words. James chapter 1. And so, we are to be faithful. And this is our responsibility. In this parable of Matthew 25, we learned that not all are given equal abilities, not all are given the same opportunities, but all have equal responsibility. So frequently in our world today, people convey the attitude, if not in word, at least in body language and in attitude, if I just do 99%, I'll be all right. I read uh, this week where 99.9% would result in 103,206 income tax returns being improperly processed by the Internal Revenue Service every year. That's 103,206 if they do 99.9% correct. If you're one of those 103, 206, you're not very happy. I wonder if God's happy with our 50% effort, 60% effort, 90% effort, or even 99.9% effort. With the 99.9% factor involved, there would be 22,000 personal checks deducted from the wrong bank account Deducted from the wrong bank account? Several years ago when we still had children at home and money was tight, I got a statement from the bank, our bank, telling me that I'd made an $800 deposit, which I had never made. And I thought, what am I supposed to do? So I called the bank. A lady answered, and I said, hello, my name is Joel Cochran. Here's my account number. I just got my statement today, and it shows the $800 deposit. And I didn't make that deposit. It's not my money. And because I was a younger fella, and she was an older lady, she said, honey, the bank doesn't make mistakes. And I said, I would sure like to think not, but I know you have here. She said, I'll look into it. Well, a month went by and I never heard anything. As far as I knew, $800 was there. This was before you could go on the internet and check your account status. And the next month, the statement came and it showed $800 taken out of there. Whoever had deposited it had apparently gotten his or her statement as well and noticed it didn't show. 22000 Personal checks every day would be deducted from the wrong bank account if the banks were 99.9% at what they did. One last, well, I actually have two last figures here that may interest you. At 99.9%, there would be 1,314 phone calls misrouted every day. Can you imagine that? If your phone call got misrouted, beep, 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 calling Serena. Hello? Hi, honey, what's for supper? Who is this? Uh-oh, my phone call was misrouted. 1,314, and that's at 99.9%. At 99.9%, .9 every day in this country, 12 babies would be given to the wrong parents. I wonder, is God happy with your 50% effort? 75% effort? 99.9% .9 effort? That takes us to the next point. Faithfulness tells us that God views 
us as responsible creatures. Secondly of all, faithfulness demands accountability. Not only are we responsible for what God has given us, how we live our lives, and the opportunities that come our way, but there is coming a time of accountability. In Matthew 25, 19, the master returns and there is a phrase that says, he settled accounts. He called his servants and said, time for accountability, time to settle accounts. God has invested talents to us and he has invented tasks for us. Someday we'll give an accounting. There is a judgment day coming. I was talking to one of our Sunday school teachers recently, and the subject came up of the phrase often found in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the fear of the Lord. Psalm 111, verse 10, as I recall, tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And a man of understanding keeps his precepts. The name of the Lord will be praised forever. The fear of the Lord can mean, I guess, different things, but the essence of that phrase, the fear of the Lord, is that someday we will stand in the presence of Jesus and we will give an accounting of how we've used our spiritual gifts, of how we've used our opportunities. I have three areas listed here that I want to share with you on giving an accounting. Someday we will stand in the presence of Jesus and we will answer for the work that God has given us to do. Ecclesiastes 9.10 tells us, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. Don't be lackadaisical about it, especially the work of God. Has God given you a Sunday school class to teach? Make it the best teaching you can give. A church to pastor? Be the best pastor you know how to be. Got a sermon to work on for this Sunday? Make it the best sermon you're ever going to preach because it might be your last one. That's the attitude I have right now. This might be my last sermon. I want it to be a good one. I want people to be challenged. I want people to be thinking about these truths. I want to people to leave the church with the desire to grow in God's grace and to know Jesus better as their Savior and to serve him more effectively with their lives. We will give an accounting for the work God has called us to do. We will give an accounting for the wealth God has called us to steward. I touched upon that briefly before we took the offer. Abram with the rescue of Lot, understood that only with God's help and by God's grace was he able to accomplish this deliverance of his nephew. And so when the priest of the Most High God makes his appearance and Abram bows the knee in worship to God, in his heart, he thinks, and perhaps with his mouth he even says, though the scripture doesn't record it, I want to be a faithful steward. I want to honor God with the wealth he's given me to steward and to invest. After all, we are to invest it for his glory. Jesus said this. It's recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. But listen to these words of Jesus. If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, mammon, by the way, most of us know that means money, but we don't know the 
derivation of the word. It was the Aramaic word for money, mammon. And that was the common language of the people to whom Jesus ministered. So it does mean money, literally, but it's an Aramaic word. If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Well, what are the true riches? The eternal truths of God. Who will commit to your trust the eternal truths of God, that there is a heaven to gain? That this world will perish in all that's in it. But heaven is forever. And we can lay up our treasures there. We can lay them up ahead of time. And Jesus uses that reference, speaking not only of looking at life from God's perspective, but in the handling of our wealth. We are to be good stewards. If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you cannot be trusted with earthly riches, how can you be trusted with eternal riches? Look, very simply, God gives to us and he wants us to give for the benefit of others. Everything we do at this church is for the benefit of others. The worship service, the Awana program that Sean talked about in the video, the sports ministries, the Sunday school, both adult and children's area, the children right now in our jam ministry, the vacation Bible school, the Celebrate Recovery program, the Grief Share ministry that meets on Monday nights, uh, Sunday nights, I beg your pardon. All of this is done to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and to help them experience the freedom that God promises us in Christ. I think of when Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of that grave, but still bound in grave clothes. And Jesus said to those standing around, you all go and take off those grave clothes. Take them off Lazarus. Only God can bring the dead to life. Those who are dead in trespasses and in sins, only the word of Jesus, only the call of God can bring life to their soul. But then there's the church. And to the church, the command of Jesus is make disciples of them. Go to them. Remove those old ways of thinking, those old habits. Show them a better way, a better way to think, a better way to live. And that better way to think and that better way to live is the life that God offers us. We are to be accountable for the work we're called to do, for the wealth we're called to steward, and for our worship also. I have a good friend who pastors a church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He was with me once, and he told me that he had been in California, and we had a desire to return to the Midwest to pastor. And I had asked him why. Everything I've heard about California, the sunny days, the nice beaches, so on, makes me think that's where you'd want to be. And he said, oh, no, it's the mentality of the people. Now, this conversation I had with him must have been 25 years ago, but that mentality now has afflicted the Midwest. He said, the mentality of the people out there is, well, it's Sunday. What will we do today? Will we go to the mountains? Will we go to the beach? Or will we go to church? It was just another option. There was no sense of obligation to God or of obligation to the church. The element of faithfulness was missing in their lives. 
and trying to teach faithfulness was very hard because they did not want to hear it. And so I came back to the Midwest because here the people are stout, hardworking, and faithful to their churches. Thank you, by the way, for being here today and being faithful to your church. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about faithfulness. And people of faith who went through difficult times, but they were faithful to God. And almost as an introduction to Hebrews 11, that faith chapter, in chapter 10, we read this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but encouraging one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching, as you see every day that goes by brings us closer to the return of Jesus. The day is approaching. Someday he will return. Let's encourage one another. Let's be faithful to our church. Let's serve one another. And let's understand that someday an accounting will be given. If your car starts only one-third of the time, would you call it a faithful car? If your internet wireless service goes down two days a week, would you call it a faithful internet service? If you're running a business and you have an employee that twice or three times a month just skips out of work, would you call that a faithful employee? Let's be faithful to God. Faithfulness is doing our duty until our duty is done. Third thought, number one, faithfulness tells us that we are responsible, responsible people. Secondly of all, faithfulness demands accountability. And thirdly of all, faithfulness requires dependability. The greatest ability is dependability, someone has said. Be dependable. Be someone whose word is bond. Be someone who can be relied upon. Be a person of integrity, of truth, and of trust. This past week, I was reading an article by a president of a college. It, was, it is not a Christian college, but it's uh, closely aligned to the faith. They have a chapel, and they encourage people to go to church and so on, and the president of this college, who happens to be a Christian man, said something that I thought was important. He said, in higher education, you might today ask, what is the purpose of higher education? And you will get various responses. But probably the most popular response is, it all depends on what you want to accomplish. And he said, that is a mistaken notion. He said, the purpose of an education and of a higher education is to discover and to know what is good, what is beautiful, and what is true. I thought, isn't that great? There's so much confusion about that. What is good? We talked about that last week. Goodness. Goodness comes from God. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God's ways are the best ways. In fact, God's way is the good way. Good, beautiful, and true. What is true? Jesus said, I am the truth. The inscription on him, Revelation 19, says, faithful and true. You can rely on Jesus. 
We can rely on God's word. He is faithful and true. That's the purpose of higher education, to discover and to know what is good, what is beautiful, what is true. Well, that takes us back to dependability. We want to be dependable people. We want to know what is good. We want to know what is beautiful. We want to know what is true. Faithfulness means doing your duty and doing it with the enthusiasm of knowing that someday Jesus will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Faithfulness is seen in the small things. We think, well, if I had a million dollars, I'd do so much for God. You wouldn't do anything more with that one million dollars than you would with a hundred or with ten. If you tithe off your ten dollars, you'd tithe off your million. Five talents, two talents, one talent. Jesus looks for faithfulness. We think if I would get that job as a supervisor, I'd start showing up diligently on time and working until the clock tells me it's time to go home instead of sloughing in late and going out early. No, you wouldn't. You might for a week or two, then you'd come sloughing in late and leaving out early. Faithfulness means dependability. Use your talents, use your opportunities, or lose them. In the Great Mammoth Cave of Kentucky, there is a stream called Echo River. And in Echo River, there are these fish that are blind. In fact, they are born blind. They have eye sockets, I have read. I've never seen one up close, but I have read they have eye sockets, but no eyes. Because generation after generation after generation, they've been in darkness all this time. There's no reason for having eyes, and so they have no eyes. The point is, use your gifts. Use your abilities. Use your opportunities. Be faithful in using them. Nothing is more important to you than at the end of the journey when you stand before Jesus to hear him say, well done. Let us pray.